Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 6, Applications of Newton's Laws, uh, part 2. Uh, in part 1, we talked about section 6.1, 2, and 6.4, what we cover in the class, what we don't, and where I'm leaving you to read the textbook. And we left out 6.3 in part 1 um, in order that we can cover it now in this week when you will be seeing more problems dealing with uniform circular motion and centripetal force. So as you look at uh, Newton's law strategy problems dealing with a circular motion, I would recommend that you go back to chapter um, four, motion in two and uh, three dimensions, and look at the um, uh, description of the uniform and non-uniform non circular motion. In chapter four, section 4.4, 4, it talks about the uniform and non-uniform circular motion. And uh, really the part that's important is the centripetal acceleration. And for the purpose of your intuition, your approach to problem solving, that intuition that I strongly encourage you to develop, that whenever there's a circular motion, there is acceleration because there is change in velocity. So, um, so this uh, usually... Um, surprises people sometimes in problem solving. You, it, in a situation where you weren't expecting to see acceleration, um, you realize that either there must be acceleration or that you have to account for that. So I think reviewing the derivation of this centripetal acceleration formula, I think it's useful. Some of you expressed being confused by textbooks and description and that's perfectly normal and common. And um, you know, now that a couple of weeks have passed and you've learned more, when you redo through this again, you might find that you actually understand this better this second time than you did the first time. Then great. Either way, you know, it, the, really the thing that's important is one, learn to expect acceleration when you are dealing with the circular motion, and uh, the, the, memorize this formula. Uh, I mean, I don't ask you to memorize that many formulas. This is one of those formulas that um, kind of uh, pain to drive from scratch and if you have it memorized you will use it enough that it'll be worth to have memorized so make sure you review that as you are looking at section 6.3 and in section 6.3 like the rest of chapter 6 that you have seen the textbook has um, a lot of examples that deal with newton's law um, problem solving what we call standard strategy and the examples you see in this section will be dealing with uh, where something is moving in a circle. And for now, we'll only deal with a uniform circular motion, meaning we have centripetal acceleration, but not tangential acceleration. Um, the situations potentially involving tangential acceleration, you might see them once we uh, introduce work and energy and are better equipped to deal with um, acceleration that's more <laughs> general by, I guess, not dealing with it. <laughs> later so um so this is a quick review of well, actually i guess it's not a review um this is description of how uh, centripetal force uh, causes centripetal acceleration um, so read through that and your textbook gives some example of how you might have circular motion so there could be a uh, friction static friction that's uh, allowing cars to turn on a flat ground and um Depending on the road design, there might be banked curves. This is a, like a standard, uh, classic uh, example of problems involving circular motion. The banked curves are the inclined plane problems of the circular motion. So, um, so do take a look at this example. Make sure you understand it. There are also similar examples in homework. In the homework helper videos, uh, you will see me work them out. Make sure you understand each step of that strategy. So there's banked turn and also um, a banked curve. And there's also a banked turn, which is just a um, disguised <laughs> version of banked curve. Um, and then there might be some other examples. In the lecture videos, I think I give you a conical pendulum example, and um, which is in the textbook. So, um, so you know, take a look at that. In terms of problem solving, we definitely cover more in the lectures than there is in the textbook. Now, your textbook does cover one thing that, um, for me, my purpose in mentioning it is to simply tell you to stay away 
from the non-inertial or the accelerated frames, you know, rotating frames. Uh, my, and I do uh, go through an example to mention the Coriolis force. And for me, the only purpose in mentioning Coriolis force now is to tell you, please just stick to inertial reference frames and don't use non-inertial frames when you're doing problem solving. And I think, uh, you know, that will get you through this class. Uh, but, you know, your textbook does give a more detailed description of the the rotating frame. This is good for you to read it through, just to, you know, know that um, I don't recommend that you use rotating frame in your problem solving. But I, I am glad that your textbook does give this description of Coriolis force, because that is really the main reason why you shouldn't use rotating uh, reference frame at this point in your education, because it's too complicated of a situation. And our goal this entire semester is to make um, a physical situation as simple as possible so that we can solve them in detail with all the requisite rigor. So I think that's all it for this uh, um, chapter overview, um, uh, short overview, part two. <laughs> and uh, uh, for additional coverage of uh, problem solving involving physical situation, involving uniform circular motion, please look at the lecture videos. Thank you and bye.